We are now in Esther chapter 3, and we will cover the entire chapter, verses 1 through 15. We want to read through this first. As always, if, I just want to say this one more time. God's Word is perfect. It is more perfect than any commentary that you can read, any thoughts of anyone, any preacher, any teacher. What my desire is, is that I, as I have studied this, is to open this Word up to us today. To understand that God, just because His name is not mentioned, does not mean He is not there and that He is not in control. That He has just wound things up and taken the day off. God doesn't take a day off. But I want us to be able to look at this book and for the times that we live in when so much of the world says there is no God and so many who proclaim to be a Christian live as though He is far removed and that they can just live in the shadows. But this is to encourage us and it's also to show us, to reveal to us What God allows and whom God will use to cause his people to um, fulfill his word in the earth today. So we will start in Esther chapter 3 verse 1. After these things King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, They cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all others, other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work, and bring it into the king's treasures. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with, as, do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus it was written and sealed with the king's signet. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out and hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. If you remember when we went through chapter 2, Esther chapter 2, it ends well for God's people. Esther is chosen to become the new queen by the most powerful king in the world. If you remember when Nebuchadnezzar came and took Judah captive, he he ruled over 120 provinces. Now as the Persians are in, um, in rule instead of Nebuchadnezzar, 
they rule over 127 provinces so that he's expanded. The kingdom has been expanded. And so he is the most powerful king in the world at this time. Mordecai, her guardian, has helped save the king's life. And it is recorded in the chronicles of the Persian government in the presence of the king. Remember, the Bible is not written as a history book, not um, although it has historical dates, places, and people recorded in its pages. Esther was not written as a history of the Persian kingdom, nor the history of King Ahasuerus and his exploits. It's not about uh, King Ahasuerus, the Persian kingdom. It's not recording their history or him and the kingdom and those who serve him are recorded. Those the, the things that are recorded here about them are recorded to reveal who is in control. And what you should see through all of this is the hand of God. We are looking into Esther to see our God's providential hand. Moving his all-knowing hand and his all-seeing eyes. His care for his people to know that he changes not encourages us today. Haman is a type and a foreshadowing of the coming Antichrist. I want you to be able to, and then I don't know that I'm fully capable of teaching this, but my desire is that you would see this chapter. You could actually see the type and the foreshadowing of the Antichrist that is to come. Here he is. He steps in out of nowhere. And he influences this king to annihilate a whole race of people. But we're going to see this on a global scale. When the, when the Antichrist comes, it will be a global extermination. As we look at our own time and the world we live in, Christians in much of the world today live under governments that are ruled by godless leaders thinking that they are God. Governments that are making themselves God. We we are very um, have a bird's eye view of that. In the countries where the governments are making themselves God, are the Christians in these countries living as the Jews did in Esther's time, prospering, settled in, complacent? Are we here in America as the Jews were in Esther's time? Not confessing who we are? Remember, Jews are there because they turn their backs on God. I want you to hear this very clearly. The Jews are there because they turn their backs on God. They were a nation in covenant with God. Now remember how this nation begun. It begun by the um, Puritans who came in, came over here, were in covenant with God to have a nation where they could worship God freely. The Jews at this time were practicing idolatry. They trusted in themselves and in their king. They mixed God's word with all the pagan teachings. And we also know that they had kings who would rise up and he took everything out of the temple and replaced it with different uh, worship, uh, different sacrifices. And um, I could just go on and on with this back and forth, back and forth. But the kings did not look to God for help, but to Egypt and to other nations they locked up and killed God's prophets. And, and I just want to mention Jeremiah. He's one. Every time he would bring a word, he would have to hide or send his secretary out to read the word that God had given him. He was put in prison. He was dropped in a well. And so we see how the king reacted to God's word. And how does the government react to God's word? They were chastised by God using nations more evil than themselves Take seriously this when you say how powerful we are as a nation. When you set yourself against God, God only needs one man. So he uses a nation more, power, more evil than they themselves. They're taken captive and they're held there for 70 years. And God placed upon the throne then, at that time, a king who said, all who want to return may go freely. I'll give you everything taken from your temple, plus all the supplies needed to rebuild your place of worship. Mordecai and Esther's family decided not to return. When this order was decreed, most of the Jews stayed. Only around 42,360 Jews returned. Now listen, these Jews, they had 
homes and they had jobs here in this this land where they'd been taken captive and their homeland had become the wild lands only the poorest were left when Nebuchadnezzar went in and he took them he took captive and he took over the land he burned the temple he burned Jerusalem they left only the poorest and the sickest people that's who they left they took the best and the brightest and others they killed three or four generations have lived under this godless rule they were not accustomed to temple worshiping temple worship a ruling priesthood what was normal to them was paganism compromise your god was kept a secret mordecai knew jewish history as i believe as i have read through this this is the this is the conclusion that i have come to that mordecai knew jewish history as i believe even today jews all over the world do they listen jews all over the world can tell you about adolf hitler and who he was and what he did now jews by birth is what we have today then is now but not faith is what you have in israel residing i'm not saying that you don't have a sect of religious jews but the majority of them and especially those here in america and abroad in europe and all they are jews by birth but when it comes to their faith that maybe they practice it on holidays i i'm i'm not sure but the general thought is that you know god left us when hitler came in and so they've left their god now christians are not born christian jews are born into a jewish family by lineage being a jew is also their faith they just don't always practice it but christians are not born christians but we must be born again to be a christian no matter who you are even a jew has to be born again to become a christian we'll see here in this chapter that god allows for a season listen god allows for a season for us to just coast along your silence but he will bring all to the place where we must confess publicly what we say in the shadows concerning him who he is Haman's are revealed. God always will reveal a Haman. Morda, Mordecai's and Esther's confess. They must come to the place that they will confess. We confess publicly or when we stand before him, he will deny us to the Father. Matthew chapter 10 verse 33 says, "But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven." That scripture is still relevant for today. no matter what other no matter what uh some big time big name charismatic star preacher or or singer might tell you that is still relevant today if you do not confess that so now let's look at verse 1 after these things king ahasuerus promoted haman the son of hamadatha the agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him This is so amazing. After these things, after what? After Mordecai makes known the king's life is in danger, after he's made Esther queen, we see that he recorded it, but he did not reward Mordecai. Now the Persian kings prided themselves on rewarding those who were loyal to him. And especially, don't you think that if someone told you that there were um there was a plot to take your life that you most definitely would would give them a tremendous reward but there was nothing. Now you think, "Oh, the king forgot. God is in control of this. It's not the right time for Mordecai to receive his reward. God is in absolute control. Do you think that God is not in control enough that he can bring things to our remembrance and remove things from our remembrance? God is in control of this. Normally, we know that he would have been rewarded richly, but not here. Now, but out of nowhere, this man Haman is given the highest seat under the king in all the province, above the seven princes who advised him to remove Queen Vashti. Remember when that happened? He turned to them, and he had advisers, he had princes, he had governors, but no one that has been mentioned previously in the first two chapters do we have here. Do we see Haman's name, the son of Hamadatha? Hamadatha the Agagite 
Now, I want to give you just a little, a little bit of history on who this man was. Because it is truly important for you to be able to understand. Because if you just try to read through this, it's your daily reading and you're reading through Esther. You still get to this and you can still be troubled as to why. Why would this happen? We know that Abraham is the, he is the father of the Hebrews, the Jewish nation. God entered into a covenant with him and then he entered into a covenant with his son Isaac, the promised son. And then he entered into a covenant with Isaac's son Jacob. Now Abraham had a son Isaac and so then God uh, made covenant with Isaac. He added to that, then Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. We know that Jacob loved God and the things of God desired them. Esau despised them. The only thing that Esau loved was his own flesh and whatever met his needs. We know that Jacob had 12 sons. They're the 12 tribes of Israel called the Israelites or the Jews. We know that Esau, he moved away, he moved to Edom, and he began to be the ruler of Edom, and then they're identified as the Edomites. The Edomites have always been enemies of Israel. Uh, Esau had a son that was born to him, and this son had a son. His name was Amalek. Esau's firstborn son had a son named Amalek, and that's in Genesis 36, if you'd like to turn back and just read that right there where where it is. And so this is Esau's grandson, Amalek. And now in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19, this I want to read to you. Moses is recording this. He says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess as an inheritance, as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Okay, God tells them, listen, he has something against them. They've been enemies long enough, but when, when Israel is coming out of Egypt and the stragglers, those who aren't able to keep up as well, and, and the young, all of those that were lagging behind, those who were tired and weary, listen, they attacked them. They didn't attack them head on, but they were sneaky and they came up from the rear to begin to destroy them. And God says, no, this is not going to work. It is also recorded in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 15, you can find it there also if you'd like to read it. But I want to read to you also out of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. We know that uh, this is hundreds of years later after Deuteronomy. God has given Israel their first king. They cried out for a king. So God gives them a king. And now I want to read to you out of 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 through 3. Samuel also said to Saul, Samuel is the prophet and the priest, and Saul is the king. The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now listen to this. When God gave that decree, Amalek, God had already said that he was going to destroy them. God had already said he would have war with them from generation to generation. Because of what they done, he reminds them here. When they were settled into the promised land, they were supposed to do that. They never did. Now God gives the command to the first king of Israel. He said, you destroy them, you wipe them out. Now, this is important. I want you to, to remember this when we look at what Haman wants to do. They're supposed to kill man, woman, child. It does not matter. Infant, nursing, child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. In other words, you wipe them out. You don't take anything that belongs to them. Nothing. Period. Nothing they have is worthwhile. Everything is doomed. In verses 8 and 9, let me read this to you. 
verse 8. I'm skipping down. He also, it's chapter 15. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. They became God. Saul and the people determined then that God's word was not worthy to be obedient to. They decided, no, God didn't actually mean that. So I'm taking the king. Why did they take the king? And I'm just telling you, these Amalekites, they, all of them were not destroyed. And Agag, most likely his queen, his children, probably all of those in the royal household of Agag, they were taken. And not only that, the best of the sheep, the ox and the fattens, the lambs, and all that was good. Everything that God had ordered to be destroyed, ordained to be destroyed, Saul looked at what he thought was good and the people, and they spared it. Now let's read verses 18 through 19. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and... And fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Why, Saul? Why did you do this? You were disobedient. You did not do what God said to do. And so now you have some background of what we are about to read. And see who this Haman is. What his history is and what the history of Mordecai is. And if you remember, we know that Mordecai is a descendant of King Saul. He is a descendant of King Saul and Haman is a descendant of King Agag. Now where we are in chapter 3, we're six centuries later from where we just read in Samuel till now. 600 years, around 600 years have passed. The descendant of King Agag comes on the scene. When God gives a command, remember this, he requires obedience, not partial obedience, not for you to sit down with the word of God and cut part of it out and say this is not really what he meant. Listen, I never want to do this with God's word. We need to be obedient to what it says and look at it and know that it means what it says. You don't necessarily need someone to interpret it. God's word, if you read it and you obey it, you will never go wrong. But if someone says, oh, God didn't really mean that, that is where you better step away because they are wrong. Stick with God's word. So when God God requires obedience... God has not forgotten his word against the Amalekites. God, God gave that word to Israel when they came out of Egypt about the Amalekites. And when he spoke to Saul, do you think that he had thought over it those few hundred years and said, you know what, maybe I was too harsh on them. And Saul really knows what I mean when I say this. Samuel's going and he's saying, I'm saying all. But no, no, I don't really mean all. God's word is firm. And it is established. And what we are seeing today is the firm word of God being established and being worked out in our lives, in the lives of our nation, and in the lives of the nations around us, and concerning the kingdom of God to come. When you look at the news today, when you read the headlines, read them with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Look at them through the context of scripture so that you have understanding. In verse, um, we see that um, in verse 2, now uh, the king had commanded, when he promoted Haman above everyone else, I, I can't even imagine what all these princes and governors and all of them thought about this man. We don't know where he came from. We don't know how he had been serving in the kingdom and just rose to power. But here he is, second. Only to the king. In verse 2 we know that the king commanded that all who sat within the gate. When, when you came in and out of the citadel. The gate that was there. All that, all that sat there had all that were within the gate. As Haman would enter and as Haman would exit. Everyone there would have to bow to him. It's not only about bowing. But that word homage means to give reverence. And that word is also used to give reverence to God. Now... 
listen, we know that Haman and Esther bowed to the king. They were not worshiping the king. Remember Nebuchadnezzar wanted worship? And remember what the three Hebrew men did? They said, no, even if we die, we're not going to worship you. He wanted worship. But in those countries, bowing to the king was a, was a way of honor and respect. But that's not what Haman was supposed to get. Because of this man coming out of seemingly nowhere, now second to the king is to be bowed and worshipped as he enters and exits the gates of the citadel. Now listen, not only have we been introduced to whom Mordecai's ancestors are, but also Haman's. So Mordecai knows this also. He knows who this man is because once Haman was promoted, I'm sure it went out, especially right there within the castle, the, the kingdom and the citadel right there in Shushan. This was, this was the talk of everyone and who he was. And so we know that there is a Haman to come. We know that there is a Haman to come unknown and will appear on the world scene out of nowhere and it will require all to bow and worship him we know that the time that we're living in it could come any day it could come any day and this is a foreshadowing of what is to come there are those who are hiding in the shadows who were silent about being a christian who will not say who live in the world and no one knows no one knows but God will bring you to a place where you confess him or you will deny him. We see here that Mordecai would not bow or pay homage to him. Remember he said, Esther, do not reveal your family or your people. Her family, her Jewish family, her Jewish people, do not reveal that. And we see that she is obedient to him. She doesn't do that. But God will allow his people silence for only so long. You only have a limited time and how long you can be quiet and sit on the sidelines. Mordecai's day has come. Esther day, Esther's day is coming. Your faith cannot be a historical one. It is a daily happening. God is revealed to the world through his children. We are representatives. We are his ambassadors in the earth today. We are the revelation of God to all those in the earth. So we see in verses 3 and 5, the king's servants, all those who were in the king's gate, they were bowing. Those who were bowing. Those, listen, there were those who were bowing. They worked with Mordecai. They rubbed elbows with Mordecai. And... So they say, well, hey, wait a minute. This is a command from the king. Why are you not doing this? Why are you not obeying the king's command? Uh, just think about where you work, where you work, and an order goes out from where you work in, in your office place or in your company, the school, where, uh, whatever environment you go to every day, whatever marketplace that you're in, and you go there every day, and there's been a law that's been passed, and it says that, when the managing or when your supervisor walks out, that you have to go and kiss their hand. And you have to say, oh, I honor you as highly as I honor God. What, what will you do? What will you do? And what will all your, your coworkers say to you? Listen, in, in, this, in this verse right here where it says, now it happened when they spoke to him daily. This is the exact same phrasing that was used in Genesis in the same manner as Potiphar's wife pursuing Joseph in Genesis. Constantly, no letting up. In other words, Potiphar's wife, she went to Joseph. She didn't just say, come and lie with me. She was after him, pursuing him like you would an animal, like a hunter would an animal. And we, when Joseph was cornered, he said, I will not sin against God and your husband. The paraphrasing it, Maggie paraphrased. And he ran away. She was filled with rage. Now these, all of these people around um, the king's gate, they kept asking Mordecai, why, why, why? What's your reason? Why do you think you don't have to bow? You need to tell us. And so it was a constant, constant barraging. And Mordecai's answer answers finally. He says, I am a Jew. Now, Scripture does not expound if he went into the history 
that we covered at the beginning. But as for me, I believe he did. And you can study this for yourself and decide. But what I believe is that he told them the story of the Amalekites, of King Agag, the history between his people and the people of Haman. Listen, other Jews were bowing and paying homage. Mordecai bowed before the king, so they wanted to know why. Why not? Why Why not Haman? He obeyed all the other laws. We don't even see that he had a dietary restriction as uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was nothing that was distinguishing him as being a Jew. That's what we don't see. We're just told that. But we don't see because they keep asking him. They, they want to know why. And so I just believe that the history is revealed here. I believe it's just not recorded. The Holy Spirit doesn't record every word, but it records the things that we need to know. And so for me, I believe that Mordecai then explained to them that this is what's going on. Mordecai's ancestry was revealed at the beginning of our introduction to chapter 2. And Mordecai, as I told you, is a descendant of King Saul, and Haman is a descendant of King Agag. We are told that the servants tell Haman, they go and they tell Haman to see if Mordecai being a Jew and his objection to this command would get him special treatment. That, that's just human nature. That's the way we are. Listen, I have to bow and I have to worship this man. Let's see if because he's a Jew he can get away with not doing it. It would be the same for Christians today. Haman is told first, and then he sees with his own eyes. He was filled with wrath as Potiphar's wife. So Haman was so filled with rage and wrath that killing Mordecai, destroying him, would not be enough. Every Jew would have to be wiped out. Now listen, verse 6, he wants to wipe out everyone, every Jew. Remember, I want you to think back when we talked about the 127 provinces and where King uh, Ahasuerus was ruling. Part of that was Israel also. There were Jews dispersed among all these 127 provinces. But then you had the Jews who had returned. Who had begun to build homes there. You had the Jews right there in the citadel and throughout the whole kingdom. But this included Israel also. The land of Israel. We're... Uh, <clears throat> Um, so in verse 6, this is Satan-inspired hatred. This is not the first time that Satan has inspired a man to destroy the Jewish people. Remember, Jesus comes through the Jewish people. That's what you have to see. That God gave his word in Genesis. That there was going to come one and there would be enmity between Satan and her seed. God narrowed it down to Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And finally through Judah. But it was with the Jewish people. Remember that uh, the Jewish people went to, into Egypt. And they were there for 400 years. In Exodus, Pharaoh ordered, there rose up a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. And Pharaoh ordered that the midwives kill all the male children because they were exploding in population. He said, kill all the male children born to the Jews. Satan trying to prevent God's word from coming to pass, not wanting the Savior to come. In the New Testament, Herod ordered the male children two years and younger killed because he heard that there was a king born. Satan's trying to prevent God's word from coming to pass, that the seed of the woman would be at enmity with the seed of Satan, and he would crush his head. Now listen, uh, we see here that ha uh, Haman seeks to destroy all the Jews. The Jews consider him the first person to rise up to desire the uh, extermination of the Jewish nation. Here Haman wants to exterminate the entire race. He's the first Hitler. Just a little history for you on Hitler, just to remind you that in modern, in the 20th century, Hitler in four and a half years killed six million Jews. In the year 1942, in the span of 250 days, two and a half million Jews were killed. Soldiers hunted them down. Every Jew had to die. And they stopped only because the Allied soldiers came. Hitler rose on the political scene from seemingly nowhere. He just came out of nowhere. And he promised them prosperity. And when he gave the order, everyone turned a blind eye. Hatred of the Jews has not died with Hitler. 
And if they hate the Jews, they hate Christians. Our Savior is a Jew. We are grafted into Abraham's family. We cannot separate ourselves from the Jewish nation. We cannot say that we are... Uh, we have replaced the Jews. It's called replacement theology. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. But there is such a huge population of the church that believe in replacement theology. That we've replaced the Jews and they loathe and despise the Jews. We cannot have that mindset. Mordecai and Esther are Jews and not only Jews, but remember I told you they're descendants of King Saul. And remember... What we read about Saul and his disobedience. Centuries have passed since Saul's disobedience to God's command. Here are future consequences to his family and his nation. Because he was a king and he was a Jew. I want you to think about the times that we live in and what is happening in the world today. Persia is now called Iran. Iranian leaders want to wipe Israel off the map. The same Satan that inspired Haman lives today. He just has a different name. The leaders of Iran today call the Jews the little Satan. The USA the big Satan. We cannot enter into a peace agreement. We cannot enter into any type of agreement with the Iranians because they hate us. Their whole purpose is for the destruction of Israel and the destruction of America and the destruction of Europe. Any nation that has confessed Christ, any peoples that have confessed Christ, they will remove your head. Haman's heritage is still in the earth today, and those who continue to promote it, the extermination of the Jews. But we are not to lose heart. God is in control, as he was then and now. In verse 7, we see that um, this is the first month. The first month. This is the Jewish calendar because... You see um, that this is written from a Jewish perspective in the sense that they did not give you the civil governmental calendar. But this is the Jewish calendar, Nisan. And so that's around March or April in the spring when Passover occurs. And in the twelfth year of the reign of King Ahasuerus, this is your timeline again, remember. So it's been five years since he has married Esther. They cast Pur, they, that's Haman and his servant, servants, Casting purr was a Persian practice in which we would call the rolling of the dice. So they rolled the dice to determine the day and the month of the extermination of, of the Jews throughout the kingdom. It fell in the month of Adar, the 13th day. Adar is around February, March. So 11 months, almost a whole year uh, will pass before that day is to come. You'll see that, you know, it's not only the fact that they're going to exterminate them, but they're going to give them 11 months of torment and torture with this hanging over their head. Now, Haman has a plan, but he does not have the power on his own to execute this grand annihilation of an entire race of people. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap. But it's every decision is from the Lord. See, God is in control of those dice that they threw. They may have thought that their gods were in control, but God is in control of everything. And I want you to just look how Haman presents this to the king, verses 8 and 9. I want to read this to you again, that you have this in your hearing. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a, a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples and they do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If this pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work and to bring it into the king's treasure. Notice how Haman presents this to the king. He's not being truthful, but appealing to the king's ego and causing the king to be offended and with no loss to his finances. He's covering all of his bases here. He says there's a certain people. I want to explain something to you. When Nebuchadnezzar came and he took he in, uh, took Judah captive. Nebuchadnezzar, remember on the statue, the, the image that uh, he had the dream about, 
and Daniel explained it to him. He was the head of gold and he ruled. His word was absolute authority. His word was law. That's it. But he could change his mind at any time. And then that would be law. It did not matter. Not so with the Medes and the Persians. With the Persians, the king was absolute rule. But they lived by laws. The king had, could not just say, I will do this. The king had to issue a law. And then he was bound by his own law. Nebuchadnezzar was not bound by his own law. The Persians were bound by their law. Nebuchadnezzar could say yes today, no tomorrow. He had absolute rule. It was at his absolute discretion, his whim. But the Persian kings had to write a law. And the Persian kings were then bound by the very law that they wrote. And if you remember Vashti, just remember that. And I'll probably bring that up again. But uh, first of all, Haman just says a certain people. He's very vague, not of identifying who they are. They're scattered. They're just, all, you know, just all through, kind of peppered throughout the kingdom. They have their own laws. They don't keep the king's laws, which is not true. We know that um, they were told when they were taken captive that they were to go there. They were to be good citizens. They were to build homes, build businesses, and they were to prosper the kingdom. And so they did keep the king's laws. And he said, you know, if this, if this what I'm proposing pleases the king, if this pleases you, I want you to write a law. Haman is so deceptive because he knows that once he writes that law, that king is bound. He cannot change his mind. If when he finds out who it is, he finds out what has to be, if he finds out who the people are and finds out that they, they truly are law abiding, that Haman has lied to him, he then has a law that he has to uh, abide by. Because remember when he, had, when he uh, listened to his advisors and he cast his wife out, he could not just bring her back if he had gotten over it. No. Once she was gone, she was gone. And once this law was passed, there is nothing that anyone can do. This certain people destroyed. And then, then he appeals to the king this way. And I'll pay for it. And fill the king's treasures 10,000 talents of silver, which was equivalent to two-thirds the annual tax revenue of the entire empire, or 300 tons of silver. And possibly the mentioning of the money here is because it was going to be a tremendous cost. Remember, he's got to write this law. He has to, it's going to be a tremendous cost for this. Not only that, but with all of these people killed, where are the taxes coming from? Where is the revenue coming from to fill the treasure of the king, the treasury of the king? Now, this king, you know, we see that this is an egomaniac. And he can't make up his mind about anything. He's always looking to someone else to tell him what he needs to do. And so the, the king, he just thinks that, that this is a, just a grand idea. He, has, he, ha, he doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't say, who are these people? What laws are they breaking? Um, how many people are we talking about? Um, let me talk to my governors. Let me, let me discuss this with my princes. Let me get some information on this. You need to supply me some uh, facts, some, uh, some uh, data here. You know, none. None of that. The king only cares for what pleases him. No thought for his people. This is the ruler over all of these 127 provinces. All, this is a multitude of people being ruled by this one man. He doesn't seek any advice, no counsel, for whatever reason. However, God has allowed Haman to step into this place. It is only the voice of Haman that King Ahasuerus is giving heed to. Verse 11, where the king says to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Now listen, he probably gave him the money, but I mean the people... But he was not giving him the money. This is Eastern culture. And Haman knew that he really had to give the king the money. The king says it's yours. But Haman then insists that the king take the money away. This was their way of uh, not necessarily bargaining here. But it was the king would say, hey, I will give it all to you. But actually you would say, oh, no, no, my king, I insist that you take it all. 
I, I don't understand that culture, but that's what it was like. It was like when the king said, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. He's not really going to give you half of his kingdom. You need to be reasonable in your request and what you would ask for. You would say, oh, no, I would just like uh, a one-acre plot of land. You would not ask for half of the king's kingdom. And so we see that he does. his concern is only for the money. No concern for the people, a whole race of people. And so uh, then we see in verses 12 through 14, they, they get to work. All the scribes. They're called in and the, the command is written. Just as when the, the banishment of Vashti, all the government's funds and labor are put behind this law and sealed with the king's signet ring. Remember that signet ring. Once that signet ring seals it, irrevocable. Irrevocable. I want to read verse 13 to you. And the letters were sent by the, by couriers and to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Now listen, same thing, same thing that Saul was supposed to do to the Amalekites. He was supposed to wipe them out, but he did not do it. Haman has the same law written up now, 600 years later. Now, Saul was supposed to kill cattle and all. No belongings were to come to the Israelites. But here, is, we see that they were to plunder their possessions. And this had to go through the entire kingdom. Now, I want you to stop and think about this because we don't really read. We, don't, we just read through sometimes and we don't see the significance of this. It, this law is sent out in the language of everyone that this is going to Israel also. The neighbors, my neighbor just say that, that we're li- living in that time. My neighbors to my left and to my right and across the street, they, know, they, they realize that I'm a Jew. So this order is for them to come and to kill me and my family and then to take everything that's in my home. The soldiers aren't doing this. This is for the people to do. This was put upon the people to do. This law goes out and the people there in Shushan, those right there in the capital, they were absolute perplexed. They, they could not understand. They're, they were, what is happening here? But look what the king and Haman do. The law goes out and the king and Haman have a drink. The Jews were good citizens who obeyed the laws and caused no trouble in the empire. But this law goes out it's seemingly out of nowhere. We have read the history of this. God said for them to be destroyed. Now, look where we are. All these hundreds of years later, look where we are. And I want you to think about where we are today and those who seek our destruction. If you call yourself a Christian, I'm telling you, there is a Haman coming on the scene. He will come, it seems as though, from nowhere. But I'm telling you, everything is falling into place. Our society and how it looks. Those who um, stand in the place to proclaim God's word. Those who say that they are. We live in a country where you can actually go to church or stay home. You can say I'm a Christian or I'm not a Christian. Now, it's a little bit harder because of all the peer pressure to say you're a Christian. You've not had to put your life on the line yet. But there is coming a time. And there is one like Haman who's going to come into the place. and But he's not going to have to look for someone to give him authority. He's going to have the authority of Satan behind him and God's going to allow it. God's going to allow it. But as we close this out, I want us to look at what our king has done for us, King Jesus. He does not listen to the case Satan brings against us. Haman went to the king and he presented a case against the Jewish people. No. Our king, our God, he removed his signet ring his son, and he wrote a higher law. 
and sealed it with his blood. The first law was the law of sin and death. And God wrote a higher law. That higher law is Jesus. And all who are redeemed, who turn to Jesus, are redeemed from the first law. We'll see. We will see in this that a higher law will come. Because this law is irrevocable. As is God's law. God says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so without turning to Jesus, without coming to him and believing that he is the son of God. And that his blood has cleansed us from sin. That God will accept us through him and only through him. Then that first law applies to you. But those who have turned to Jesus and believe on him. Stand on that second law. That Jesus paid the price that we don't have to pay. The higher law satisfies Jesus died for all. And so for those who have turned to the higher law. Amen. Those who have not. It's not too late yet. Turn to him and to believe. He is who he says he is. Now we will look at um, Esther chapter 4 next. And we will go through that. Amen to God's word.